Welcome to Museum Rat. I am your host, Doug Y. We are broadcasting from the beautiful Pasadena Media Studios, uh, presented on the Arroyo Channel. And today we have a very interesting show. Uh, we will be looking at the Eugene Delacroix retrospective that was at the Met uh, last year. Eugene Delacroix is a very, very interesting character, uh, f incredibly famous in his own time and really the godfather of uh, French Romanticism. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes to show the impact of uh, Delacroix in um, certainly European art. Here are just three quotes and then I'm going to tell you who they're from. He is utterly beyond the paint. Um, in Delacroix you find us all. Those are Vincent van Gogh and uh, Cezanne. Another uh, artist who was a huge fan of Delacroix was uh, Picasso, who said, quote, uh, Delacroix, damn, he could really paint. And part of what French Romanticism was about was a, um, uh, a real introspection into the, the, the gesture and meaning of life. Now this is a man, his, uh, his mother was the daughter of a very famous French cabinet maker. His father became a general in the Napoleonic army. He showed incredible talent very early and um, ended up kind of being the, the um, head of the French Romantic movement. Another really wonderful artist that we won't be looking at today, but if you dig French Romanticism as much as I do, I do. Emile Friant, um, E-M-I-L-E-F-R-I-E-N-T, uh, I-A-N-T, Emile Friant is, um, I think, another just incredible master. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is uh, Greece on the Ruins of Missolonghi. This is from 1826. And um, when we talk about what, what is the impact of art, what, what, what good does any of it do? What, what can, how can it change the world that we live in? Um, and this piece is a, a piece of propaganda that is attempting to call for uh, Greek independence. And it is very specifically targeting the conservative French monarchy of the time of Charles X. Think about this, think about the impact and the opportunity that uh, Delacroix had and the window, how small it was. This goes up in the Paris uh, Salon in 1826. It does sway the French and uh, there is a Greek war for independence uh, against the um, uh, Ottomans and the Turks uh, by the French, British, and uh, Russians. And in 1828, we have a free Greece. 1828, we have a free Greece. 1826, this, this picture is painted. In 1830, Charles X is in exile. Um, his rule is over. So the window, not that uh, Delacroix knew it, but the window for impact was very small and he hid it. How much did this picture impact uh, the campaign for Greek independence is certainly up for debate. But did it? Yes, absolutely. And this is the kind of power when you, when you hear Van Gogh say he's utterly beyond the paint. Uh, he is, what he's saying is the moment comes through. He is free of technique because he is such a master. And one of the things that we're going to look at um, is the, the use of light. And of course, light, especially in painting, is color. This is male academy figure, half length side view. This is from 1818. This is a very, very early piece. And already, Delacroix is an absolute master. Female, seated, front view, same uh, year. Look at that, look at the gesture, the hand, the reality um, of these images. And that is one of the things that I think is very interesting about French Romanticism. You can look, it has um, a Flemish quality. There's a, there's a, a true reality uh, being presented. And then 
um, more impressionistic aspects begin to show through. Here are some of his sketches as he begins to test his techniques, test his compositions. I love this picture. Um, it's so cinematic. This, uh, this is a mortally wounded uh, brigand quenches his thirst. And one of the beautiful things about this piece, um, one of the, the poetic aspects, and one of the things that Delacroix continues to find are cinematic moments, dramatic moments of um, theater in his imagery that this soldier, mortally wounded, crawls to a riverbank to drink and can only drink his own blood. Ugh, poignant. This is uh, a picture of Michelangelo in his studio from 1849. Delacroix um, plays the hits. He does very famous scenes from um, mythology, from uh, Shakespeare, and uh, here depicting his uh, hero, Michelangelo, Leon Reznor. Now, while this picture is wonderfully um, uh, real, when you stand in front of it, it's almost as if this man is going to step out of the frame. Portrait of Aspasi from 1824. Uh, one of his favorite uh, models and uh, uh, painted her many times. Now, when we talk about French Romanticism, we are not going to be mired in much morality. Um, French, romantic, uh, he is going to be curious with passion, curious with intrigue, allure, um, eroticism. The passions that are being inflamed in this and the passions that are being inflamed for independence and democracy. He's very much um, in the blood of freedom of his time. Uh, Neridi, this is, this is a, a study after Rubens. Um, he studied Peter Paul Rubens extensively. Now, it, this picture makes me blush. Obviously, it's making the uh, uh, the subject blush. This is the Duke of Orleans showing his lover. Um, the story here is that he is, uh, the Duke is showing a husband, uh, his wife, um, although the husband does not know that it is his wife, he is uh, portraying his, uh, he's showing his, his lover off to his husband. And this is something that that Delacroix does uh, quite often. There is a voyeuristic quality. There are, there are people who can see things, people who can't see things um, in, the, in the compositions. The fetishization of uh, female, Greek and, uh, female grief and emotion in this picture uh, and in many of his pictures. But I think it is interesting the emotional qualities that he lays into his characters. Again, um, very erotic. This is a lady and her valet. She is, the lady is uh, uh, reclining on her bed awaiting her valet who, as you can see, is hiding in the background and in the darkness. And again, the figure is clear, is masculine, is dressed, and yet how little is there. Um, totally with color, beautifully done really, truly masterful. This is another interesting piece, a Greek and a Turk in an interior from the 1820s. Now, what difference does it make? Well, one, this is a watercolor. And look at the technique. Uh, look in his shoe, you can see the leather, you can see the line work. But one of the other things is um, the idea of a Greek and a Turk sitting civilly and discussing something was, uh, revolutionary, the multiculturalism uh, here was revolutionary. You're talking about um, 
a Greece that had been oppressed for over 400 years. And not only does he paint for the independence, he paints for um, the recombination of the cultural and uh, geographic neighbors. Studies of coins and pencil, just incredible. The depth, the, the shape of it, how it comes off the page. I mean, he really does seem to be totally free from um, technique. He seems to be completely uh, self-actualized as an artist. Wild Horse Fell by Tiger. Now, interestingly about his, uh, he does a lot of tigers, like your best friend in the 70s who had a van. He paints a lot of tigers. Um, they were more exotic then, and he was very interested in scenes that were outside the realm of human experience. Things that happen in the world that have nothing to do with us, that have nothing to do with humanity. And also uh, such poignant scenes of humanity, um, such morally dubious scenes of humanity. These are his studies for the tiger. Look at that, my goodness. You know, interestingly, um, in his lifetime, the, uh, there was a tiger at the Paris Zoo, and when it died, he, he and his friend read it in the newspaper. They rushed to the zoo and asked the zookeeper to be able to see the tiger. And um, especially, uh, they requested to dissect the tiger's eyes. And if you look at the eyes that Delacroix creates, the, um, the, the incredible luminosity of tiger eyes is very difficult to translate into two dimensions, and yet he does it so well. And in pencil uh, here, and uh, in full oil paints later. This is 19 studies of the head of a lion. Another wonderful tiger picture, look at those. The reality, and you get, a, this is an enormous painting, and you get up close and uh, you, it, you see the fur and the hair and the weight of the animal um, in a way that not many artists can render. Death of Sardanapalus, um, one of his most famous pictures, which is about a king who has given up. Uh, he sits in bed as everything and everyone, uh, his entire kingdom is uh, pillaged, um, and he does nothing as this scene of, 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 of horror goes on around him. Again, a hugely cinematic uh, scene. And he does a lot of these. He does a lot of uh, Arabian battles. Um, horses, fighters, look at the dynamism, look at the energy uh, of the horses and of the riders, all of the different flowing garb, the dust at the hoofs of the horses. Um, it could be so easy to lose your way as an artist in this image um, and have it be muddled and everything is crystal clear, the energy, the motion, the characters. I, I just, um, I marvel, I marvel at Delacroix's uh, work, which obviously is something that um, uh, artists and laymen have been doing for centuries now. Another battle of, uh, of horses and, and riders. And keep in mind, French Romanticism, so who is the audience for this? mostly people who have not been to Arabia. He's painting romantic images, um, somewhat imagined, although he did a lot of traveling himself. Um, in 1832, he had a, a life-changing uh, trip through uh, Algiers, Tangiers, and uh, North Africa, Morocco, all of those different things. Um, but his home audience was uh, was very much French and, and, and mostly had never left uh, Europe. Um, then he does some of these wonderful pictures. Uh, look at how many characters there are in this. And the light on the table as it glows off of everybody. 
Why would a table glow? But you don't think about that. And he uses the light glowing off the table to light all of the faces of the characters in this piece. Seems so dark. And again, these pictures are enormous. Um, I had to stand way back in the gallery to, uh, to shoot these. And again, the, the darkness, the light, look at the light on those figures, right? And how much storytelling is in where he uh, places the light. This is probably his, fam his most famous image. This is Women of Algiers. Um, it is depicting part of his trip uh, in 1832 um, and was a huge sensation when he came back. Is it an odalesque? Mm, it's certainly aware of those things, but I, I, I find it um, interesting the lack of eroticism as these women sit in their apartment and, um, and smoke hookah. There is certainly uh, a romantic atmosphere around them. And again, look at how much her foot, look at the feet and the, and the hands, the light play and how it differs between uh, skin, flesh, um, and cloth, uh, and the walls. It's really um, a masterwork. And uh, it was uh, an incredibly famous piece when he painted it. Then he does studies of the men of Algiers. And I just want to take a moment just to look at the dignity, the costuming of this character. Um, there is no doubt when you, when you think of, you know, uh, Gauguin is getting a lot of criticism right now for his depictions of um, the Tahitian women in particular. but. When you look at these characters, or the, or the, the women in, in Algiers, they are people as opposed to objects of desire. And that I find really interesting. Delacroix always is um, able to bring forth the humanity of his characters. And um, whether he is depicting a half-naked uh, woman or a wholly naked woman on her bed um, or a, a man sitting in contemplation so many artists can find themselves stuck um, in the objectification of the other or the objectification of the object of desire and Delacroix never robs his subjects of humanity and that, I think, is very interesting. This is Moroccan cavalry. So difficult to organize all of these elements, and then the execution is flawless. Um, this, I find, a really interesting piece. Um, this is uh, Medea about to kill her children. This is from 1838, and... Um, the story behind this is uh, Medea is Jason's um, wife, and when she discovers Jason has been unfaithful, she takes their children into a cave and kills them. Um, the French translation is uh, the abandonment of reason, Medea's abandonment of reason. And when uh, I brought up earlier the idea of the fetishization of female grief and emotion, um, you could make an argument here for that. Uh, the idea that, especially from the male gaze, the male perspective, um, there is a fetishization of female grief in that women in grief are depicted as being, um, having lost their minds uh, to the point of being murderous, that a woman in grief is dangerous. And this is something that uh, continues to perpetuate itself 
through art today. If you look at the streak of um, hot horror films in the last, let's call it five, six years, many, many, many of them are about a woman who has uh, experienced the death of someone close to them, either a partner or a child, and it is through that experience that um, the horror comes out. And um, the fetishization of female grief is, is uh, something that I am certainly um, aware of and curious about as to its, its origins and um, its messaging, for sure. Hamlet and Horatio, you know, he plays the hits. Uh, this was a, a very famous and popular uh, piece in its time. Now, he was incredibly famous, and the salon is uh, competitive. Uh, putting your pieces up in the French salon was um, a big deal. You were there to be judged. He did not need to, and yet throughout his career, he continued to put his work into competitive situations and not repeat himself. Um, I'm sure that's easier to do when you are so unbelievably gifted, um, but it is also noteworthy that this was a man who did not sit on his laurels, um, did not grow um, fat and um, complacent, but instead continued to look for ways to push himself. And look at this, and again, these images are huge. This picture of these flowers is, oh, probably four feet by six feet. It's really, really large, and, and this one as well. So beautiful. More studies of still lifes, of flowers, of fruit. Now, we will not be able to get to all of the images that were in this retrospective. It was massive. In fact, I could only get through half of it before my brain and my body were exhausted. I had to uh, go to the cafe and rest before I came back and took on the rest of the, of the show. But to go from huge battles um, cries for independence, moments of um, eroticism, private eroticism, still lifes uh, out in the world. There was really nothing that he couldn't tackle and I believe he was fascinated with not only this is a study for Christ, um, I believe he was, he was fascinated by passion and uh, passion of the Christ, right? You have the passion. Um, I believe that that was the driving, what is in the blood? What is the energy that pushes man uh, to do anything? And I believe that he saw that desire as a combination of um, beauty, freedom, and control, which of course have paradoxes in them and uh, lead to so many complicated moments. This is the finished piece uh, after the study. He spends um, seven or eight years late in his life uh, doing images of Christ. Look at the muscle, the mus, the muscle. Excuse me, the musculature of the character, and again, incredibly dramatic lighting. Um, and this is somebody working in the uh, mid to early 19th century. None of the there. He's not working off of photographs. He is in the true. Um, lineage of the masters uh, of Europe and um, th th his ability to use these techniques is just unparalleled. Begins to paint a lot of trees. 
You know, I find it interesting if, if you go, you look at Edward Hopper, who of course is from a totally different uh, style and lineage, but if you look at Edward Hopper's work, he starts out with a lot of characters in his work. Um, and slowly those things minimize, there are less characters, the, the scenes get simpler and simpler until finally it's simply how is light striking on uh, a wall. And the reductive quality of um, Delacroix's later work I think points to uh, something very human uh, in the artist that um, after many years of doing this type of work, seascapes, right? He wants to be doing um, more peaceful, quiet pictures. Um, but in, in, in the true dramatic quality of Delacroix, we will finish uh, with this incredible scene um, of a lion felling a, a horse and rider. Um, this is Doug Wye. Uh, for Museum Rat, thank you very much for joining us.